Hello. I thought I'd give you some relief from the heat by telling you some stories of Christmas in July. Nobody pays any goddamn attention to me. I'm just that person people push past in lines, the one nobody listens to when he talks. Sometimes, when people keep cutting me off, I just move my mouth to see if they'll notice that no sound comes out. But nobody ever notices. Ever. You know, the worst one used to be my sister. My perfect big sister, Cassandra. Oh, Cassandra got a new job. Cassandra had such a nice vacation. Let's listen to Cassandra talk about her new boyfriend. Let's listen to her talk about her life's problems. Oh, Cassandra, Cassandra, Cassandra. Every time the family got together, she'd just take over every conversation. And then, it was as if I just stopped existing. Nobody cared. I just didn't matter anymore. Every Christmas, Easter, fucking Thanksgiving, Cassandra ruled it all. And I fucking hated her for it. God, I used to wish that Cassandra would just fall into a fucking chasm in the earth and never be seen again. I wished I could just hit her with a hammer when she started speaking so I could shut her up. Maybe then my own family would finally remember that I existed. Then, one snowy Christmas Eve, I got my chance. I saw her leaving our parents' house and going down to her car. I was already in my car, ready to leave. I watched as she got out her scraper and started brushing her car off. She was really just standing there in the middle of the street. She probably hadn't even noticed I was even there. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision. I'd admittedly been dwelling on how she decided it was necessary to cut me off every time I opened my mouth throughout the night. But I hadn't planned on doing anything about it. Not until that moment. What happened next played out like a dream. I hit the gas. The car screeched forward. I saw Cassandra look up in the moment before I crushed her between my car and hers. For a split second, she looked at me. She saw me. And that look on her face. Oh, Mama. I ironically don't have the words. They never caught me, you know. Cassandra's death was considered a hit and run. It's still unsolved to this day. And the ones after her are unsolved, too. That look on her face when I squished her like a bug. That moment when I crushed her life away. It all lingers in my mind. And I want more. Need more. So every now and then, when the circumstances are right, and I find someone deserving. Rude people. People who humiliate me. People I just don't like. I deal with them, just like Cassandra. And in the moment before I hit them, they see me. Oh my God, do they fucking see me. And that, that is what I live for these days. Today is Christmas Eve, and I am excited to finally wear something proper to greet my wife at midnight. I started getting ready when she left the house for work, getting everything to match a fine suit, along with a nice shower, shaving, and haircut, and nail trimming. Just thinking of her reaction was enough to make me grin from ear to ear. My wife is really perfect. She's the best ever. Whenever I see her, my entire day is made. Considering I don't see her often due to work and other circumstances. Finally, after hours of waiting, 
relaxing in my usual spot. I hear her coming through the door, so I get ready to surprise her. As she is not looking, I start coming out of the air fence, ready to show myself after years of staying up there, watching her from a distance. I'm really excited to surprise her this Christmas. The schedule is always the same. At 5 p.m. we eat dinner. At 6 we put on our pajamas and watch It's a Wonderful Life. Then at half past 8, Mom makes us take sleeping pills and we have to go to bed because we can't be awake when Santa comes. It's bullshit. None of my friends' families do crazy shit like this. I'm 16 this year and I stopped believing in Santa years ago. So earlier tonight, when she was handing out the pills, I hid mine under my tongue and spat it out in the toilet. I pretended to be extra sleepy and went to bed. Only I wasn't tired. I was wide awake and ready to stay up to figure out what my parents do on Christmas Eve that they don't want us to know about. But now, I'm curled up under my covers, gagging while chewing on three of those little white pills and trying to get them down. I need them to work fast. I have to get to sleep right away. My whole family is asleep, and I should have been too. I don't know what the hell those red spidery things are on the Pearson's roof but the ones that went down to the Smith's house pulled their daughter out the chimney. People aren't supposed to go up chimneys. I'll never forget the way she screamed. I'm starting to get a little drowsy, but I can hear the weird clicking sound they make on the roof. It sounds like hooves, but those things aren't reindeer. I think they only take people that are awake. Now I know why my parents wanted us asleep. Feeling romantic yet? His voice boomed over the PA system, drowning out both the echo of my heels, clacking down the concrete corridor, and the low hum I first noticed when I awoke. Two weeks earlier, I was the new girl in town, my first trip to Alaska, thanks to relocation. I made the best of the coldest, darkest December nights I ever knew. The cafe near the hotel was cozy, and I spent more and more of my free time there. It wasn't until the night I wore the Santa hat that he approached me. Do you like Christmas? He said gently. I looked up, and sure he was talking to me. He stood there, wearing an apron and staring at me. He wasn't unattractive, and I didn't know anyone else in town, so I played along. It's my favorite holiday, I replied, smiling. Mine too, he said. Soft music a comfy blanket, a roaring fireplace, and mistletoe. My eyes widened at him being so forward. Oh, and hot cocoa, he said, and placed a large full mug next to me. It was cute that he was so nervous, never once smiling. I went back every day for my free cocoa. I couldn't deny it felt good being pursued. That is until tonight. I got to the cafe just before closing and saw the lights go dark. I was glad when the door opened and I got out of the strengthening wind. Lights hung festively with Bing Crosby singing in the background. The barista came out from behind the counter and locked the door behind me. Come away with me, he said, holding my arm. 
The intuition I ignored for so long hit me like a gale. Uh, actually, I stuttered. I just came by to say Merry Christmas. I gotta run. Those eyes didn't show any disappointment, and he didn't loosen his grip. I motioned toward the door and feigned not being in fight or flight. Don't you want your cocoa first? He asked, handing me some. I took it. He waited. I took a sip. It was warm and rich and tasted a little funny. Say, what's in this drink? I joked nervously. He said nothing, and my vision blurred before collapsing. I woke to that droning on cold concrete. Above me were flickering fluorescents and blinking red lights on cameras. I was now wearing a red and white miniskirt. I fled faster than my mind raced. Mistletoe hung every few feet, let it snow, slowly spun up over the ceiling speakers. Each heavy door I threw open revealed a drab room, decked for the season, candles, garlands, fireplaces, and more mistletoe. I wiped the running mascara from my cheeks. As I reached the corridor's end and a final door, the song ended and Baby It's Cold Outside began. With a heave, the door swung open and the hum became a roar. The screaming wind muted my own. Beyond the frigid dark and whipping snow was nothing but empty wilderness. Every year, a week before Christmas, my family would hold a Christmas party at my grandma's sister's house. The whole family would show up. Me, my mom, grandma, aunt, great-grandma, uncle, cousins, the whole family. You get the picture. In and out retrieving presents from the cars and bringing them inside. Non-stop action. Everyone having a good time exchanging presents eating good food. It was a great family tradition. The problem is, with all the traffic in and out, no one ever remembered to lock the front door. Why would you? The house is packed. There's 20 people in here at least. But on this night, the what could go wrong went wrong. It started off like any other year, family walking in one by one, presents in hand. Smiles and hugs and small conversation fill the house as family members get reacquainted from the last time they saw one another. Then a Christmas feast is served. Roughhousing with the cousins ensue. Then the best part of the night, present exchange. We would get a present from each family member, which was great, and then a Santa would walk in and pass out the yearly stuffed Christmas animal to the kids. Now the Santa was usually someone we all knew, like my aunt's housekeeper's husband or other family members. But this time, I had no earthly clue who this man was in the Santa suit. No one noticed anything strange at first, but after a couple of minutes, I nudged one of my cousins in the arm and said, Who is that, playing Santa? He shrugged his shoulders and said, Probably Pete, the housekeeper's husband. I looked this Santa up and down and thought, I don't think so. I looked around the room and noticed some of the adults had a weird look on their faces as well, like they knew something was off. The Santa crouched down to his kids and opened his bag. Look what I've brought you, my precious little tots, he exclaimed. Then he pulled his hand from the bag, holding one of the stuffed bears. His hands were dirty and stained brown or dark red. His suit was covered in stains and smelled of death. I swear this man hadn't showered in two months. 
He raised his head up slowly and looked into our eyes. His face looked strained, teeth gritted so tightly I thought a tooth was going to snap off and hit me in the face. And his eyes, oh, his eyes, they were wide and bloodshot and crazed. This was a pure madman we were looking at. He started to twitch, then he rose slowly and said, Enjoy the presents, kitties. Then he turned around and bolted out the front door. The adults began to clamor, their voices panicked, wondering if that was supposed to happen. Was that Pete? If not, then who the hell was that? Just then, Agnes, the housekeeper, said, That wasn't Pete. Everyone said, Are you sure? That was not my husband, she said. Then a loud scream came from the living room. Our cousin Jessica kept saying, Where's Tabitha? Where's Tabitha? Her three-year-old daughter. She was nowhere to be found. All the men rushed out of the house, led by my uncle. When they got outside, they saw the man in the Santa suit, pinned to the ground by the neighbor's German shepherd, and little Tabitha peering out of the back seat window. The neighbor explained he was just finishing walking his dog when he saw this guy dressed as Santa running out of the house holding this little girl and heard her saying, Let me go. I don't know you, mister. I want to go back inside with my mommy. He heard the Santa say, Be quiet, little one. I'm going to take you home and give you milk and cookies, then stuffed her in the back seat and closed the door. Then the neighbor said he approached the man in the suit and said, What's going on here? What are you doing with this child? He said the man just looked at him and smiled, then attacked. His dog helped protect him and get this crazed Santa to the ground. Everyone thanked the neighbor over and over for preventing Tabitha from being taken. Then we got Tabitha out of the back seat, brought her inside and called the police. While waiting for the cops to show up, we heard a moaning sound coming from behind the brick wall next to the front door. My uncle and a few of the older cousins went back there to see what it was, and in the shadows, it was Pete, dressed in a Santa suit. He had been knocked out by this crazed Santa. Pete said he got here when he was supposed to, parked his car, got out, went to the trunk to get the bag of stuffed animals, closed it, and started up the driveway to the front door. Then all of a sudden, he heard a laugh and felt a blow to the back of his head. Just then, the cop showed up and arrested this man, Santa. It turned out the Santa's real name was Charles Bardo. It was explained to us. He escaped a prison bus that was transporting him from a mental facility to a maximum security prison. When the bus blew a tire and rolled off to the side of the road into a ditch. He had just been given the death penalty for murdering his entire family on Christmas Eve, two years prior. Once he escaped the wreckage, he made his way to the nearest town, ambushed a mall Santa on his way back to his car, killed him, stole his suit, and stuffed him in the trunk. That was two weeks and two states ago. He just got into town the day of our party, stopped at a gas station, and saw Pete putting gas in his car, and decided to follow him, either for a new car or a new suit. He then waited for Pete to get out and get the things from the trunk, then ambushed him from behind and threw him behind the brick wall. He has a demented fascination with Christmas, the police said, and that we were all very lucky. Lucky that the neighbor was there to save Tabitha, and lucky no one was killed. They said the large gathering probably helped that. Yes, we were lucky, but no matter how you slice it, things were never the same again. 
and our wonderful family tradition never took place again. Thanks, Psycho Santa, 